it's also a window into both Rob and I's friendship and his immense power that I took an all night flight to introduce him. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Rob is probably the only media executive in the world who used to be an editorial cartoonist, and I think that's very important to know about Rob because it's that creative thinking that fuels much of what you'll hear from him and much of what he's done at ESPN. Uh, I like to joke that until he got a recent promotion, he was my boss's, boss's, boss's boss. Uh, but, you know, he was in charge of ESPN.com and ESPN the magazine. And among his many things he wanted to do was take two separate media organizations and combine them into one working unit and eliminate redundancies and maximize you know, the, the creative output of the organization. And you know, I was part of the group who had to take his plan and do it. And a lot of people at first were like, well, that's impossible, we can't do it. But new media is figuring out how to have one newsroom that is platform agnostic, and I feel like he's going to talk a lot about that. And and you know, no one knows what the future of media is going to look like, but I think that he might have a better idea than anyone else. So listen up. Uh, you know, what else do you need to know about Rob? Uh, Rob's new job is he is the he's in charge of Sports Center. He's in charge of Outside the Lines, and he's 60. Basically, anytime there's ever a conversation in a room in Bristol about something happening. Rob's in there arguing for journalism and arguing for the stuff we all believe in. And I always take a great deal of comfort knowing that Rob's in those rooms. And Rob's a big fan of the, of the police. Rob happens to be a wonderful father, which is how I usually judge people, and is a very smart guy and a dear, dear friend. So please welcome Rob King. Honored to be at Old Miss. I'm honored because I've spent, as you would imagine, enough time checking out the things that happen here to know what goes on in this very special place. I also know the great work. How many people here are, are, are journalism students or touching journalism communications? Right. And how many are juniors or seniors? Right. So I also know the kinds of stories you've been covering and the way you've been redefining life at Old Miss. And I know that there have been a couple of events recently that have felt like pinpricks. Well, that's all they are. That's all they are. Last week I was at Penn State. And you talk about a university community that's trying to overcome something that feels like something more substantial than a pinprick. Yet what I saw last week is what I saw here, right off the bat, that people are justifiably proud to be here. And you are redefining every single day what this experience is. And you are part of a very important American narrative. So I know you get a sense of that. I know that the news events make you feel as though you don't know where your place is. Folks, you are central. You are helping people change the way they think about how we live with one another. You're doing something very important every day. So it's very, very, very much an honor for me to be here with you. I want you to, it's, you don't get to just get up and go somewhere where people are doing something that matters every day. I feel like that, that's true for me. Now, one caveat is, you know, I flew in from LA to Memphis, landed in Memphis last night at like 9.15 and then drove here, no, 10.15 and then drove here. So there's an excellent chance that I'm going to be speaking gibberish at any moment. And I want to prepare that for you. But in the meantime, one thing I want to cover off right off the bat about ESPN, I said this earlier, ESPN is every bit as cool as you think it is to work at. It just is. There's no getting around it. Wright got off a plane from Argentina. He was doing journalism. That's cool, all right? I spent a lot of time in the last few weeks. We're getting ready to go into a new Sports Center set. So our current Sports Center set's pretty good. How many people here have seen Sports Center? Just want to be clear, I'm not leaving anybody behind. All right. So it's pretty cool. It looks pretty sharp, you know, the anchors are moving around. There's a there's a stand-up on a stair set. There's 15 really cool screens, got touch screens, what have you. It's it's pretty nice looking set. State of the art facility. May 26th, we go into a 10,000 foot square foot studio, eight anchor positions, 143 screens. Right? <coughs> We're gonna do all kinds of telestration. 
The anchors are going to move around. We've got a JITA cam that flies across the top of the ceiling like a sky cam, so you'll be able to see the whole set. And then we've got incredible new graphics, and it's just going to change the way you, you see sports. And it's awesome. And you got people like, you know, like our, like our anchor talent just can't wait to get into the space and see what it feels like and what it looks like. Um, you know, every night, every day, I'll be sitting there at my desk and I'll hear, you know, all this commotion going on at our pods. The other day I was sitting there uh, and I heard uh, Linda Cohn and a whole bunch of other folks cracking up because they were having this argument about whether a grown man can wear a jersey, walk around in, in a jersey. And, you know, then they got to, and what if you're wearing a jersey with your own name on it? And that was like our discussion. That was work, okay? So uh, I told this story earlier. When I first got to ESPN, I saw two people huddled in the corner having this, this really serious discussion. And when I interviewed at ESPN, I thought, all right, well, you know, everything's happy-go-lucky. It's sports. But this was the first conversation I saw where people were like really having a serious conversation. So I decided to eavesdrop. So I start walking by just to like listen to what they're talking about. And this guy goes, God, God, I hate that happened. That was really, really dumb. God, I hate that. And the guy talking to him says, yeah, well, but who did you draft in the second round? Because they were talking about fantasy football. <laughs> it's like, where am I? All right. So it is every bit as cool as you would imagine. We have great aspiration across all screens. You know a lot of these things. So you're using a lot of our products. You're spending a lot of time watching our, our talent. Uh, it's, it's a really cool place to be. I, meanwhile, am not that cool. I want to be clear about that. But I can share what I have learned to this point. And the reason I want to share this is because I'm more focused, having spent time paying attention to what Ole Miss is about and who you are likely to be about, I'm more focused on doing something that's about you. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to tell you what I've learned this is about branding. I know this is about social media. It's about a lot of things here today. But I want to give you some stuff you can take with you. And if I'm successful, then you can ask me anything you want about uh, ESPN, and I'll answer all questions. All right. So the first lesson I would throw out to you is something called let Ricardo touch the ball. Okay. Let Ricardo touch the ball. The good thing about these bullet points is you're going to write them down, and tomorrow you'll be like, what the heck did let Ricardo touch the ball mean? All right, so I'll tell you. I played basketball at Division III Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, where in 1982 I became only the second Wesleyan Cardinal in school history to dunk in a game. All right? In 1982, we were playing some, some team with a bunch of big, rugged guys. And I went up to the basket, and somebody cut my legs out from underneath me. And I hit the ground, and I partially dislocated my shoulder. And it was a dirty play, and the benches, the benches cleared, and the refs grabbed me up out of there. And they pulled me over to the bench, and I sat down at the end of the bench, and the trainer's talk, talking to me. And I'm sitting next to a guy named Ricardo Granderson. And Ricardo was the 12th player on our team, the last guy ever to play. And he, was, and, he, and he barely practiced. And he was sitting next to me, and he leaned over. He goes, you OK? You OK? And I said, yeah, I'm all right. He said, man, you should have got up and just punched that dude. I said, man, what good would that done? He said, that way everybody would have been involved in a brawl. I could go out, and I could actually touch the ball. <laughs> So my point is, you should approach your time in journalism and your time with each other, and I know you are, as an opportunity for service, OK? You should embrace service as part of what you're doing. I know in journalism, the glow is about storytelling and getting to go to fat, fancy places, but it's really about serving your audience. At ESPN, all we talk about is serving fans. It's why we got into the phone business. It's why we're so deep in the digital space. It's why everybody's committed to being in the social space. It's that's because that's where you are. OK? It's where you are. A recent trend in the last couple of years, we've decided to back off search engine optimization because most of you aren't starting out with a Google search. You're starting off in a social destination where your friends are telling you what they're excited about or what's really cool. So just paying attention to how you behave has driven how we behave. Most of you are consuming most of your information through something you got in your pocket right now. So we have to be in the mobile space. We have to serve fans. When we start telling stories, we got to think about what do people need to know. They might not just need to know the score. People want to know how it happened or why it happened or what's going to happen next. It's about serving fans. And when you think about the audiences that you're going to reach through what you're doing, 
Think about service, embrace it, okay? It's an important part of what actually is gonna differentiate your work from others, is your focus on your audience. It's just like if you're, if you're a fiction writer, you know, instead of thinking about, think, think about anything other than your reader, you know, that's kind of a waste of energy. Think about who you're telling the story to, who you're telling the story for. Embrace service. Service, by the way, is a very important basic part of what journalism is about. The second thing I would say is, this is, this is the next point beyond the Ricardo point. This is getting to the one thing that I think most of the seniors want to know, which is, can I get a job? All right. Are there jobs out there for me? Do I have to move back in with my parents? Which I did for eight months. I don't recommend that. The answer is in a job interview, in any job interview, I want you to take this with you. The job interview is never about you, ever. Job interviews are merely about the problem that the interviewer is trying to solve, okay? So you see an opening and you apply or you send your resume and if that is all about you and the stuff you've done, and yeah, you, had a, you worked at Walmart, and then you, 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 know, you, were, you were an assistant trainer, and then you did this, and blah, blah, blah. And it has nothing to do with the problem that the person's trying to solve. You're wasting your time. And I'll give you an example. So in September, for the very first time, we had, in all of our digital traffic, most of it, 51%, was mobile. 49% was online. First time that it ever happened. And it has been true every month since. September was the tipping point, right? So in late October, I have somebody come in for a job interview. And she sits down, and she puts a piece of paper on my desk. And on that piece of paper is her name, and her phone number, and a QR code. So I got to pull out my phone, look at the QR code, and bang, here's all the stuff she's done. Here are the links she's created. Here's the videos she created. Because she knew that our issue was mobile. And in the interview, she forced me to pull out my phone. And I was like, kind of got to hire you. All right? But all that is is having done the research, paying attention to what's going on in the business. And you have way more access to that kind of information than I did when I was your age. When I was your age, I wanted to be an editorial cartoonist. So what I had to do was go to the library and get a book. There are these things that are called books. And <laughs> this book was called the Editor and Publisher Yearbook. And every year it was published, it had the listing of every newspaper, every editor, every managing editor. Many of those listings were out of date because people had left, but you didn't know. So I wrote to the like 75 newspapers, had the managing editor's names, I went to the papers that had no editorial cartoonist listed, and I sent my cartoons blindly off to these people. I didn't know what the newspapers looked like. I didn't know what stories they were covering. I didn't know what politicians mattered. I just sent my stuff, like I was gonna solve their problems. And you know how many of them called me back? <laughs> oh, for 70. All right? And if I'd done any of that research, I might have had a shot. In your world, there's no business you can't find out about now. There's nothing you can find out about anybody. Even if it just shows up, WhatsApp shows up one day and somebody spent a billion dollars on it, you can find everything you need to know about WhatsApp like that. All right? You can find out who's running the company. You can read news articles to find out what their problems are, what their goals are, or what their rumored acquisitions are going to be. And you can figure out a way now to present yourself as part of that solution. All that information is available to you, all right? But just understand that. If you see a job opening, if you don't do the next level of research into what that employer is about and what the questions might really be about, you might be wasting time. So understand, it's not about you. It is about the hiring manager. Now, in the spirit of true uh, first take, arguing one side and then arguing the other, I'm going to talk about how it is all about you, always about you. All right, so let's look at it this way. You're now, you've been here two, three, four years, okay? You've been away from home two, three, four years, and there's this big, scary world sitting on the other side of these two, three, four years. And it's just waiting, right? And you have friends on the other side, and you ask them, how's it going out there? And they, they say things like, oh, you know, it's, it's okay. They don't give you any details, right? So you don't know what you're walking into. You have no idea. And you think, well, who do I have to be in order to survive out there? What do I have to learn? Especially if you're seniors, because March. Who do I have to turn into by May in order to get a job or survive in this world? 
And you got that tension sitting on you because you're like, did I waste three or four years? I don't know enough. Who am I? What can I provide? It's just, it, the pressure is just happening, all right? Let it go. Tell me right now, let it go. Okay? You are important no matter what doorway you walk, you walk through. Because the truth is, at your age, you're going to go through a stretch where you're going to take a job. That's not the job you're going to finish up in. It just isn't. I'm going to tell you what they didn't tell me when I was your age. I'm, I'm Morpheus. I'm going to give you the red pill. You're getting ready to go into the awful in-between, okay? The awful in-between is comfort of home, comfort of school, wilderness. And the wilderness lasts 5, 8, 10, 12 years. And there's, there's, no, there's no workaround unless you're LeBron James. You've got you to gotta live in this world where you're going to take jobs that may not be perfect. You're going to walk into places where you're not going to like everybody. You might not drive the car you want to drive at the outset. You might not be able to wear the clothes you want to wear at the outset. You might, it might seem like everything else out there in the world is more glamorous than your world. Okay? When I was in the awful in between, my first full-time job was in Danville, Illinois. I was there a year, two weeks, three days. <laughs> when I left Danville, I didn't look in the rearview mirror, mirror again until I was in Dayton, Ohio. But I also, and I, and, and I, I was making no money, and I was working in a very small newspaper, and I used to have these dreams that it was Thanksgiving at my grandmother's house, and I'd wake up, and I'd just have baked beans and macaroni and cheese, and I'd be so sad, okay? <laughs> and I had a car. I remember when I turned 24, I had a Plymouth Horizon that was such a ratty car that the, the upholstery was coming off the ceiling, so I used to have to take the rearview mirror and flip it up to keep the upholstery off my head. And then on my birthday, my 25th birthday, I got my paycheck on a Friday, and I didn't go to the bank in time to cash it. So here's Saturday morning. I wake up on Saturday morning. I got $10 to my name. Somebody has stolen the tire off my Plymouth Horizon. All right? So I have a Sears credit card. So I go down, and I get a new tire, and I spend my $10 that I have on lug nuts. And that was my birthday. And if my friends hadn't called me and said, hey, do you want to come up for a barbecue, I might be standing here today. That might have been it. You're awful in between may not have to have days like that. But I'm telling you, that's the world. And if you look at all the adults in here, they've all been through the awful in between. They don't want to tell you about it. They want you to feel happy. But you all know, we all know those moments. We all know them. We've been there. We're just sitting there going like, man, when's this going to end? Okay? You can't get around it. So why worry about it now? It's happening. What you need to do is take this time to fully embrace who you are. What have you learned? What do you like? Who do you know? Who are your friends? and carry that with you into whatever place in the awful in between you go, because it matters. One, thing, one advantage you do have at this university is you're changing things, okay? You know how to change things. You know how to talk about your community in ways people don't understand in the greater community. Any room you go into, any newsroom you go into, any journalism space you go into, that is an advantage. Sell that. Sell who you are as a consumer. You're what everybody wants. The reason Facebook is spending billions of dollars in acquisitions is because they thought they had the business model that would last forever and they already realized that they do not. You're spending time in places that they weren't aware of. Sell that, okay? But understand that this time that you're going through, that you're going through the last three years, is part of a continuing time that is incredibly important for you and it matters. Don't let any job application, don't let, any, any, don't let a family member who doesn't understand what you've been doing for the last three years, don't let anybody tell you that who you are doesn't matter. Because in the end, on the other side of the awful in between, you will have earned all that space by owning who you are. Does everybody, is everybody with me? Because this is really important. Because you could be led to believe that if you're not going to X interview session at X day with X resume, you don't matter. That's nonsense. It's nonsense. And if you're a journalist or a storyteller, it's not getting you anywhere. If you're going to be a journalist now, you've got to work hard to write. You've got to, you've got to produce as much bad stuff as possible. Am I right? You've got, to be, you've, got to be, you've got to get all your terrible stuff out. My first job at the commercial news, I told somebody this earlier. You know the terrible mistake I make publicly? I was a graphic designer, and I built the NCAA brackets wrong. I had the wrong regions. We stopped the presses. The only time ever in newspapers we ever stopped the presses, I had the wrong regions facing each other. Okay? It's true. I admit it. I'm now running Sports Center. It's okay. <laughs> My point here is you've got to give yourself the leeway to do a bunch of terrible stuff. The really cool thing is, even beyond school, 
the access to places to publish or, pr or produce video, you guys, it's wide open for you. You got no concerns. When I wanted to be an editorial cartoon cartoonist, all my practice cartoons got seen by my mom, okay, who loved everything. <laughs> and then by those 70 newspapers who hated everything. So you have a huge, you can get it out into the general space, you can share links through social, you can use, you know, post videos to Vimeo and let people that you trust see it so they give you feedback. You have a world of opportunity that our generation never had. So take full advantage of that. Learn who you are. Uh, what's the next point I wanted to make? Oh yeah, here's the other thing about the awful in-between. And this is tied to the previous, the previous point. Wherever you do go, mentally unpack. Don't be sitting there saying, yeah, I'm here and I don't really want to be here. I remember the year, two weeks and three days in Danville vividly. I met my best friend there to this day. I went to, I went to, Louis, I went to a Danville, I got a library card, a video rental card, and oh, I had a YMCA membership. I was set, all right? Mentally unpack, be where you are, own it. It's okay. These are stories you're gonna tell forever. I mean, I could tell a lot of Danville stories. If my friend Alvin A. Reed were in here, my best friend, if we were in here, we'd keep you going for hours on the one year we were together in Danville because we realized that it was fun and nuts and the rules were crazy and, and it, that's the point. It's kind of like what you're doing here, all right? That's the point, mentally unpacked. Don't be afraid, even if it's where you don't wanna be, just be there, okay? Again, older folks in the room know exactly what I mean. All right, you know, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to have three incredibly wise women touch my life, and they gave me three pieces of advice that I want to share with you. Um, the reason I'm actually in a job of management and not just doing editorial cartoons and living in my own office is because a woman named Alice Bonner told me when I was getting ready to go to my interview in Danville, Rob, it's, it's 1980, I don't remember this, 1987. There are too few people of color in newsrooms. It's not right for you just to go in your office and do your own work and then go home. You need to help other people. You need to take a position of leadership. And at the time, I was 24, getting ready to turn 25. It's like, I don't want to hear that. I just want to draw. But she was right. And so if you think about the newsrooms you're going to walk into, or you talk about, think about the, the offices you're going to go into, Particularly if, you, if you're, you know, coming from Mississippi and you go to New York, there's a lot of stuff you can teach people in New York. Take it from me. Take it from me. I'm not, it's not a joke. You know, regardless of who you are, where you're from, what your background is, it's, it's, a, it's incredibly important to kind of know yourself. And in my case, Alice said you have to get out and help other folks. This goes back to the service point. Know yourself, right? And understand it's too precious, especially generationally, it's, you're too important not to just go off in your little hovel, unless you create Facebook. Then if you create a new Facebook, you're doing everybody a service. Um, Wendy Ross was a woman, I, I, was a, I was a, for a year, I was a copy of the Washington Post. And this goes also to the awful in between. Uh, she goes, at one point she goes, Rob, how old are you? I said, oh, I'm 23. She goes, ah, by the time you're 30, you'll be five different people. You'll be in and out of love. You'll have different cars. You might have different pets. You'll definitely have a different haircut. You'll have clothes that you won't wear at 30 that you were wearing when you were 23. There are friends you have now that you won't like. You get to be five different people. It's true. It happens to be true. So my point is, while you're figuring out who you are, give yourself permission to change. Give yourself the permission to change. Part of that is just staying open. What do I like? What, what's, what's, what's interesting to me? Why haven't I talked to that person? This is, again, the mental unpacking. If you, if you wind up in Danville, Illinois, you know, why haven't I talked to that person over there? But the point is you are going to change. It's part of the awful in-between. You're not done. You're not finished products. You're just not. That's okay. Because the third piece of advice I got from a woman named Amanda Bennett. Now, the full story is we built our family. My wife and I built our family through adoption. By the end of May, our kids will be 10, 7, and 6. But it took us a long time to become parents and find our kids. And there was a point at which we were in total despair. And I was in my office, and Amanda Bennett came into my office, and she said, it's going to work out. You just don't know how yet. It's going to work out. You just don't know how yet. 
when I was your age, I wanted to be an editorial cartoonist. And I drew, I drew thousands of cartoons. And I knew with great certainty that that was the thing that I was going to be when I grew up. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing now. Nothing. When Amanda Bennett said that to me, my wife and I didn't think we would ever be parents. Now, these loud, stinky kids dominate every waking moment. All right. You just don't know how yet. And the truth is, you don't get to know. Much as we would all like certainty. It's just like covering sports. I have this, I have this bone to pick with political coverage because election night, you know, the news groups call the election two-thirds through the choose the way through the night, and they go and have pizza, and they're all happy that they made deadline. In sports, we don't get to do that, right? We don't get to know how it's going to turn out. Last, you know, we talked about Indiana, Miami all day yesterday. We didn't know how that game was going to turn out. Tur by the way, it turned out pretty good, all right? The point is, with your life, you might have things you really want, things you've always believed, things you're going to try. That's all necessary. It's all valid. You just don't get to have certainty at this point. It's okay. Now, I, I guarantee you, there's going to be a point in your life where you look back and you go, man, that was true. Because that's how I feel about it when Amanda told me. So I just want to give that, I want to pass that along to you. Those three women, the three wise women, pretty much changed my life. So, here's what I would, I would say in a bit of summary. Many of you right now are in that career chase. I guess start my career. What's my career? How do I start my career path? What's the best thing for my career? Stop thinking, about, stop thinking about it like a career and start thinking about it as your journey. Okay? It is a journey. A lot of twists and turns. You're going to have some goofy bosses. I guarantee you're going to have some goofy bosses. People work for me right now have a goofy boss. You're going to have triumphs. You're going to have failures. You're going to have uncertainty. It's a journey, y'all. Okay? The burden of trying to leave this place with a career in tow is it's unrealistic. And it's, it's, it's worse than that. It's keeping you from the self-discovery that I think is the most important part of your life right now as you get ready to go into the awful in-between. And it's going to lead me to my next point. If you think about this as a journey, that should give you permission to be the age you are now. Okay? I'm 51 years old. I'll be 52 in May. It took me a long time to get to this point. I know, black don't crack, I got it. But it took me a long time to get to this point, OK? You are allowed to be the age you are. It's Thursday. Thursday night is the official beginning of the weekend. I expect to see everybody out being the age you are. I don't expect you to be trying to have a career tonight. I don't expect you to put that pressure on yourself, all right? If it's a journey. And I, this makes me crazier than anything else. I'll get on a train, I'll get on a plane, and I'll look around, and nobody's looking out the window. Everybody's got their, their face in a screen, everybody's got their head down in a book, and nobody's looking out the window. Look out the window. It's a journey. Enjoy what you're seeing along the route. All right? Just sit on the steps and watch people walk around. Just watch them. Watch how people move around campus. Care about that. All right? Be where you are now. There is plenty of time to worry about career. I got it. You want to have a great interview. You want to have a great job. You want to graduate. I got it. I still have the dreams where I didn't go to that one math class, and it's graduation day, and my parents are there, and I'm not sure whether I got enough credits, and I'm scared. And I'm, you know, I have that dream to this day. And it's always a math class. It's never, never a writing class. Look out the window. Look out the window. The thing that ESPN gives the people who work there every day is permission to have wonder. When Wright goes and covers a story, when we go to cover a game, when we get ready to do a show, that's the thing that's sort of underrated about ESPN. When you watch SportsCenter or you watch any of our shows, that enthusiasm, that wow, can you believe that that happened, or man, I can't wait for this to happen, all that is is the celebration of wonder. Isn't this amazing? Isn't this a great opportunity? All right. My only concern about the narrative around journalism overall is that there's a closing window, the door slamming shut, you got to get in before it slams on you, and there's all this pressure to get an, have an answer immediately. It's false. 
If you think about anything, any story, anything that's moving people, even the tragedy of Flight 370, a lot of that was, what happened? What happened? If you think about anything that's capturing people's imagination in popular culture, you know, I got, like I said, I have a son and I got two daughters. And I took two, my two girls to see Frozen. How many people have seen Frozen? All right. There's nothing like going to see Frozen with sisters. <laughs> right? Changes everything. I went to see the movie again with them a second time to watch them watch the sisters in Frozen. Because, you know, ESPN's part of the Disney company. It's about wonder. Marvel is part of the Disney company. So part of my perks of my job is I'm a former cartoonist and they found that out. I get to go hang out with the guys in Marvel whenever I want. Before the, the Thor sequel came out, I went down to the Marvel offices. Yeah, we're going to let you read the script. So I, that's great. I come down. I walk in the door. They take my phone, take my backpack, lead me into a room. Technician unscrews the phone out of the room. Guy says, should take you 90 minutes to read that. Leaves the script. 90 minutes later, knock on the door, take the script back. Now, I read it. But... So there's not a lot of trust there. But we did, but, it, but it was, it was, it's the kind of thing where like, they know that I really want to be in that space. And you know, walking around those offices, people there were as interested in ESPN as I was in Marvel because we share that in common. Man, how did you think of that? Where is that coming from? How do you keep it going? What is next? All right, give yourself permission to wonder it, more than anything else, will get you where you want to go. If you wonder about the company that you're going to try to interview with, you'll get answers. If you wonder about storytelling and you really want to make sure that something happens that people can connect with, it'll work. If you wonder, give yourself permission. I just feel like, and I, like I said, I was at Penn State last week. I go to a lot of college campuses. I see a lot of faces that remind me of what I look like in the mirror. Right now, there's too much pressure to get a certain answer. So I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. Give yourself permission to wonder. It's going to work out. You just don't know how yet. All right, with that, I'll take some questions. Any questions, by the way? Yes? Uh, yeah, kind of a quick question. Um, I know it's not buzzed lately about uh, Mark Cuban and his comments about the NFL and voting in the next 10 years. Um, and I just kind of wonder how, if, 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 first of all, if you believe that's taking it off, and then secondly, if there's been any application of that to me, me considering how involved you are in everything, um, everything sports and mobile apps and TV and computers and everything else. Does every people in the back have a question? Okay. Uh, my personal point of view is that Mark Cuban has very strong views about media, technology, sports in general. And generally, he has, he has a reason to have a point of view. There's business reasons to have that point of view. Um, it's certainly, you know, we're at a point now where the NBA is negotiating new rights deals, and so, you know, there's a sense that it's an opportunity to talk about the NBA's relative presence across all networks as, as compared to the NFL. The NFL just did its deals. So, I think there's some business motivation behind some of the things Mark Cuban said, my guess. But I also think that some of the points he raised are, are worthy of concern. Concussions are no joke. So, and the league knows that. I mean, the question was posed to Roger Goodell yesterday at the end of the owners' meetings. I mean, Roger said that that's something they continue to take very seriously, even at the level of young kids learning how to tackle. Um, you know, personal conduct is an issue. You know, they're talking about throwing flags on guys using the N-word on the field. Or you got the situation in the Miami locker room where there's, you know, some measure of lack of control, even though we'll never really know, I don't think, exactly what happened. Um, and, you know, the league, like all the other leagues, has turned into a year-round league. You know, we, today as I speak, Johnny Manziel's having his pro day. So if you've got to watch ESPN up, that's what we're doing. Okay, just, just tell me. Um, and so in that respect, we are complicit, but we're also about serving our audiences. And our audiences genuinely care about the NFL. They care about the NBA. And, and we're working very hard to figure out all the ways we can serve the NBA interests and Major League Baseball and other sports. But, you know, um, I think the 10 year time period is kind of an arbitrary number. The truth of the matter is, a lot of folks sense on a lot of fronts that you gotta do some things that are fairly aggressive to ensure, to ensure that the NFL stays where it stays. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. National Labor Relations Board. Yeah. Did you 
hear that in the back? All right. Uh, it remains to be seen. There are going to be appeals. Um, the commissioners of various uh, conferences generally did not see this the same way, and so I think that's going to force some continued legal conversation. Uh, you know, I think it's hard to argue that you want to make sure that student athletes are cared for. Um, I, don't, I don't read this as a broad outreach for new lines of compensation, but you know, I do think that this is an important step in having a deeper conversation around what the condition of the student athlete is, and when he or she is devoting the amount of time that they are to the sport, what the, what the appropriate relationship with the university should be. So I don't know, I mean, it's, it's certainly a moment in time. It's certainly <coughs> it's something that now has the attention of a lot of folks in ways it didn't before. I still want to see where it goes. Yes? <clears throat> How come the NHL doesn't get uh, as much coverage as all the other sports? So this is a question we get every year for the last 15 years, and pardon me for taking advantage of the layup. <laughs> But in terms of minutes per day, we have about 40% more NHL coverage in Sports Center than we did six years ago. And we created franchises like the Levy Lounge, where Steve Levy will get his groovy music on, and he and Barry Melrose will actually sit down and do extended highlight rips. John Butchergrass, when he does the 11 o'clock Sports Center, likes to say at 11.48 into the show, and now we get to our lead story. But we actually have done a very critical assessment, because we've heard that before. And by the way, we got a lot of hockey fans in Bristol. We got a lot. So there's, there's a lot of energy around highlights, particularly as we get closer to the playoffs. But it's just a, it is a, it's something that's commonly discussed. It's just not factual based. Yes? Yeah, I've got a question. The fact that you named all the players is that there wasn't a mass media and everything else. Don't you think to an extent that Sometimes a journalist will go overboard and overkill somebody like we've heard so much about LeBron. Uh, you know, he would never be the greatest until he just did so many championships. The thing that Tiger did was an awful thing to do. But don't you think that too bad, too long, the criticism that they received? Here's how I look at it. What was the question? The question was basically overkill. Media overkill on topics like LeBron or Tiger. Thank you for not mentioning Tim Tebow. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, I did. Uh, <clears throat> so here's the thing. First of all, I think Sports Center is now live 18 hours out of the day. There was a time not just I think this is only now we're only five years into this. There was a time when there was a Sports Center that was live at six and eleven and one a.m. and then we would re-air the one a.m. all the way until. Uh, till three. We didn't do 9 11 when we didn't do any of that. So we're doing live sports 24-7. But by the way, so is everybody in the digital space. And the conversation never stops. And by the way, LeBron James likes to be in the media space himself. He tweets about events he's got nothing to do with. LeBron James chose before the NBA All-Star Game to list his Mount Rushmore and let Bill Russell off the list. Do you think people are going to talk about that? I think athletes today are much more savvy about their presence in the conversation and they don't want to leave it. And I think that between the other networks out there that are trying to do um, sports more fully and between ours doing more live programming, we're doing it because this is an audience that does not want to wait till six o'clock to talk about it. I want to talk about it now, right? Justin Bieber asked the fool in court, do you want to hear about it, okay? Um, and you want to hear about it right away. And I think a lot of news agencies are responding to that constant conversation. When you do, you have what could be viewed as overkill. Some people might say the coverage of Flight 370 was overkill. Okay? There are a lot of mornings I'm driving in and I'm, you know, I'm listening to CNN on my radio and I hear the interviewer ask experts a question they cannot answer. Right? And this, this is what happens when we're on all the time. But I don't want to just lay it at the feet of the media. Because again, the athletes and the leagues and the teams know that they want to be in your mix at all times. Because they can't control when you pull out a phone or when you reach for a remote or when you look at a tablet. So they, got, they want to be there. If the bucket is empty, you will leave. And they don't want that. So we're all responding to the marketplace. And in some cases, you know, we have multiple networks 
talking about topics. We still have ESPN2 talking about the top five, six topics of the day across Mike and Mike and First Take and um, Numbers Never Lie and Highly Questionable and Overman. We, we do go into topics that people are talking about all day long on top of sports today. I got it. But I also know that if you go to Twitter and you tweet LeBron James, there's a conversation about LeBron James going on 24-7, 365 that we couldn't see until Twitter was created. But it was happening. Okay? It was happening. It was real. Um, it's just now that we have access to all this, it can hit you like a sledgehammer. That's what I wanted to ask you, though, because I think all athletes, especially on a professional uh, level, understand the journalist's job and the report. And he knows when the place is bad. Their job is to say that. But I just want, I was trying to have you show what I could have done about that in the day because there was no this mass communication with so many ways to do things that you didn't normally hear about certain yeah, and I would also pile on that what you talked about, whether an athlete is, is good or bad, is a very small part of all that media exposure. You know, Tim Tebow doesn't have a shirt on. We talk about that, right? <laughs> well, we did. Um, you know, if, if so-and-so is in a club, that doesn't have anything to do with whether they're good or bad. But there are many people out there with camera phones creating media that show us for the first time what that bad behavior was. You know, that's Forty-two years ago, I flipped in the bird when I was coming out of court. I don't like it. Still don't like it today. All of this is going on. But nobody knows that. Actually, no, I saw that on Twitter this morning. I said, Johnny Newman keeps flipping the bird. And I saw that. <laughs> but nobody knows that I did because of the, the great opportunity that I in journalism. Yep. That's why I wrote it before. I think it's going to be my agent. I think it's fantastic. Is that the back of our day? I mean, the point is, look, all this, the point is that's happening now is we are just so much more connected. When we were separated and segregated, there's a lot more quiet because we're now in such proximity. By, by that I mean digital proximity. We can't get away from it. Topics fly at us. Even, you know, I don't care about some folks in uh, social media. Like, Sunday nights, I look at Twitter, some Sunday nights, I got, it's all Walking Dead, Downton Abbey, Sunday night football. It's like, it's, you know, I can't get away from it. Those, that's the touchstones of the people that I choose to follow. So these communities are sitting right hard up on top of each other. And that does feel concussive, there's no doubt about it. Uh, now the good part is, I'm gonna spin it to the good part because the way you all think about it is, so it's a problem. The good part is you can play in this space. You can have an active role in this space. And by the way, please be purposeful. You know, I can't tell you how many people apply for a job and I go to, I literally had somebody apply to a job for, and, and on the resume was their Instagram handle. <laughs> so I go to their Instagram handle. Now, the first clue should have been, this person had 67,000 followers in Instagram. It was about the babies. <laughs> and so I always, I would just urge you, think about when you apply, about whether there's any documentation of you're having gone to a beach <laughs> or a bar, you know, or any other establishment that might stretch the employer's definition of appropriate, okay? Just think about that. Social, your social behavior should be purposeful and in line with the image that you're trying to maintain. Having said that, it's still an opportunity to participate <coughs> richly in this space. So while it might seem like it's, for our generation, a lot of noise and confusion, you're starting out, my, my kids don't know. My kids, they, they'll push buttons, they'll swipe this, they'll try to reach this person through an Xbox. I mean, it's like, you know, I turn on, my, turn on the television, it's doing something, I don't know what it is. You call my nine-year-old, Eli, what's, what is this? And I work in television. So, you know, your generation's a different place. Yes, sir. But, um, for, like, institutional employees, do you do, like, social media background checks? I know you said she put her uh, Instagram handle, but I know there's a lot of stories about uh, what she posts on yeah. social media. So do you look back and, I mean, if, college students, they do college and stuff, would you actually... If you put it on the resume, I'll click the link. I mean, if you put it on the resume, would y'all... 
Uh, I don't. I, I think it's been done in, within our HR group. I don't. I don't do that. I don't like search somebody's name yeah. in Facebook. But generally, people try to show that they're digitally savvy, so they've got all these links, right? And then you go to the link, and it's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. switched over from marine biology to journalism, it, I was very tunnel vision as to what I wanted to do. And now as a senior, and having been exposed to so many avenues, there are a lot of things that I like, and I haven't really felt that passion for one distinct area. So I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm fearful as to what I'm gonna do after graduation, but then there's this other side of if I don't pick something, go to a job that I'm going to be kind of in that awful in between for a longer period of time than I want to, but also don't want to get stuck in a part of journalism that maybe I don't necessarily want to be. So there's a couple there's a couple things. I'm sure this is true for a number of people. The first thing is the digital space now allows you to find and participate in areas of journalism right now, whether it's through a blog or whether it's through medium.com, which is a new writing platform, or whether it's through video. It lets you experiment now with areas you may or may not like. I have a friend who's, who, who, who just, she, she also turned 52 and she had a second act in life. She started surfing. And so she's created this really cool YouTube channel um, on surfing. And now it's a f Facebook page and she's getting hundreds of thousands of followers. And she didn't find until she was 52 that A, she liked to surf, B, she liked to produce television. She wasn't in that business at all. My point is, in this, in this space, you can, you can dip in and dip out. And you should use that time now to dip in and dip out. But the other point I was trying to make earlier is that figuring out how to live on a budget or how to get around the city or who your friends are is as important a part of your development as a journalist as writing for a specific media entity, site, what have you. Because you've got to know who you are to be any good. I mean, write to mania. But he owns it, okay? He owns it. He knows that he's got five stories he's got to do, and he knows what he's going to be for the next six, six seven weeks, and I, I pity his editors. But at least he's had the, he's himself the time to figure out that this is who I am and this is who I have to work. This is how I have to work. <coughs> you may not know that yet. You're just trying to find a lane. And I would say there's ways to explore lanes now in the space, but also accept that even if you don't identify the exact right job right out the door, that other learning, is going to help you identify those lanes. I promise you that. I promise you that. Yes? Well, I'm uh, curious how uh, about your brand, ESPN is a big brand. How do you grow that pie? I and mean, there's always discussions about uh, the sports programming, kind of the balance between the demographic balance between the kind of sports and the good amount of sports. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you use your key to plan and you look at your technology outgrowth in terms of do you hear that question in the back? The question was about how do we continue to grow the business? How do we think about ESPN getting a larger share of the business as, as time goes on? And, the, and so far, the, the true north has been just looking at where our audience is. So we went into the mobile business nine years ago. Failed, launched a phone, mobile ESPN. Phone failed. But that's just because we didn't understand the business of actual phone plans. But the content there taught us, OK, this is the place we have to be. Because we saw nine years ago that consumption of video on a phone can actually be a real business. And that being out there first we can actually lead advertisers to an audience that's getting the kind of content that can live on your phone. We're so specific about this. We cut a highlight. We'll cut a three-minute version of highlight. We'll cut a 30-second version because we don't want to waste your LTE minutes. So that's gotten into our content creation. We're actually thinking about every platform. Um, yeah, we do a lot, of, a lot of research about who our fans are, where they're going. We launched ESPNW three years ago, but we felt like we had a deeper, more rich conversation with women who, who love sports. Um, but, you know, th there's a mixture of big moves that we feel are strategic, like specific rights acquisitions, and smaller moves. Like when Bill Simmons la launched Grantland, that was just because he wanted to tell, bring back long-form storytelling in a way that was truly resonant. He didn't care what the topics were, sports, popular culture. He wanted an array of people, diverse array of people. He was just trying to bring back a genre. We weren't looking to make a ton of money off of that. We were trying to do something that would be meaningful to an audience. So we do a bit of, we do a bit of both. 
And certainly we've got responsibility to continue to grow our business. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I would also say that if the shortest path to doing that is really looking at our audience and anticipating where they're going and using research to tell us what people want. Uh, you asked the question about casual fans versus avid fans. You know, avid fans are finding new markets of time to spend. So they've got two, three devices going on at the same time, which we're good with. But casual fans, you know, we have to look at the content mix. Um, and some of that gets down to what sports we cover, the kinds of stories we tell, so popular culture stories. Nate Silver's launching 538.com, which is really about storytelling around data. These are all areas of opportunity that we actually identify when talking to our fans and looking at the broader marketplace. Um, and you know, ultimately, if we stay that path, we think we're going to continue to grow. Sure. Uh, HBO Sports did a pretty nasty report. I don't know if that was a really deep, but it was about big-time college football and the grades and so forth. Mm -hmm. You guys are very big-time college football mm -hmm. in terms of your coverage. How do you balance? And you also have some good documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, Well, broadly put, we don't win unless we do things with authority and personality, and the authority means getting into some harder stuff. Um, I've never had an occasion where anybody who was a business partner anywhere else said, don't do that story because it'll damage our business. We just don't do that. Um, I think that you know that the story that HBO did is very much like the big piece we did with Dr. Richard Lapchick, who we do a lot of work with, who really examines graduation rates. So we actually plan for the presentation of that information. Um, you know, we operate pretty independently as a content group. And you know, again, whether it's concussions or bad behavior off campus or money or what have you, you know, if we're not reporting that, then people will know very quickly that we're not really serious about serving their needs. Yes, ma'am. Um, how much more important is it to have a background in the subject, or how much harder would it be to get a job, say, if you didn't have a sports background? I mean, I hold a class here, mm -hmm. but say if I was trying to get into something such as football, how much harder would it be to have the work to get a job like that? Nah, if you're an athlete, you're an athlete. My experience is sports is just lingua franca. If you've been in a locker room and you sweat and you've had an off season and if you've pulled anything and if you've, you know, people will give you a chance to be in their world. Um, that, that I know for sure. We've had people, I've lost three people in the last year um, who've left it being insider writers to go work. One went to the Memphis Grizzlies um, and two went to major baseball teams. And you know, it's just because they knew things that other folks didn't just inherently. By the same token, athletes come and they show up at ES. Like, first of all, if you went to ESPN and you went to the cafeteria, you say, how many people here played a sport? Oh, hands would go up like that. Because it's just what it, I mean, you know, we have intramural basketball games. We, we have intramural basketball games with this huge court right near our cafeteria. Gigantic scoreboard, referees, it's serious business. Men and women playing together. Then there's this Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday game off campus. And I mean, you know, there are a lot of D1 players, men and women, and like, you cannot leave anybody open. And it's, you know, it's hard, hard core. And, but then we get to work and everybody's got the same language going on, you know? And, I mean, the first time I interviewed, interviewed at ESPN, I showed up on an early April day at 6 o'clock. And at 7 o'clock, all the TVs went on because we wanted to hear the national anthems of all the stadiums at the same time. It's just a freaky place, right? And only an athlete would really care about that. So, but I also think that that's true of you know, minor league sports. We're looking for people who understand the rhythm of the sports team, particularly in communicating out. You know, because you, you have a sense of what you want everybody to know and what you don't want everybody to know. I'm sorry, we're going to, all the faculty are going to have to quiz Mr. King on how to keep a room beyond the end of class time. So um, let's say thank you very much. Thank you.